Yes. yes. In the room, they can hear me on the webcast. Can you hear me? And I got another yes. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, I'm just going to start. Daryl is teaching today, as you'll see from the slides. Um, he's doing legislation and regulation. I just want to touch base on the flashcards and the test I sent out last night. Um, Daryl posted both of them. If you haven't been to the ENB site on the 911 Resource Center, please go there and you'll find your flashcards and your test. And the test is really just to test yourself so that you can see if you learn. And it makes you study because now you're going to get, into, get introduced to a whole new topic. And if you don't keep up with it, you it will be overwhelming. So just study every as we give you two weeks. Get it in there, get a study, and that's how we're sending out flashcards and um, tests so that you can go see how much you know and you don't. So we're not going to go over the test. Some of you probably haven't even taken it. We're going to, I will send out answers probably tomorrow. So um, you can go download the answers. Um, I might be sending it to Daryl tonight. I'll just highlight the right answers. So if you have questions as to why that's the right answer, just go ahead and email me, and I will um, answer your questions because we just don't want to take class time for that. So um, with that, here's Daryl. We're going to go over 911 operations, legislation, and regulation. Okay, and before we go, so that you guys can hear, and if you can't, if, if I uh, start to fade out or anything, uh, go ahead and type it on the screen. Debbie will be monitoring the chat, uh, the chat log. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, 911 operations legislation and regulation. Uh, I'm going to start by kind of introducing myself a little bit. I, I think most of you, have, I've introduced myself to some extent. Uh, my name is Daryl Branson. I'm with the Colorado 911 Resource Center. I started my uh, career as a call taker and dispatcher in Springfield, Missouri. I've been a shift supervisor for a call center in Wisconsin. I was a PSAP manager in New Mexico, and that was all before I came here. So I've done, I've done varying levels of, of work in uh, PSAPs in different states. Um, it's kind of given me, a, I think, a, a kind of a, a rounded perspective. You know, get to see how different organizations in different, different states do things uh, differently. Um, and I got my ENP in 2005, so I've already been through the recertification process once. And, you know, really, as long as you go to classes and, and uh, you know, take some take some opportunities over the course of the four years that the certification is good for, you don't you won't have any trouble recertifying. But uh, one thing that I spend a lot of time on now is uh, legislation and regulations. Part of the job of the Resource Center is to keep up with what's happening at the state and federal level. And I think I started to fade out again. That should help. Um, I don't like hearing myself that clearly. Is what it comes down to. Well, they, that's why the webcam is right in front of it, is so that the microphone on that is picking it up. Um, anyway, so that's one of the things that we do is we track uh, legislation and regulation uh, at the state and federal level. Uh, and so I've learned quite a bit about that over the last few years. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So just to kind of summarize, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start with funding, enabling, uh, funding and enabling legislation. Enabling legislation means the, the legislation that gives local governments the authority to, to provide 911 service or states to provide 911 service. Uh, we're going to talk about the telecommunications regulatory environment. Uh, there are a lot of players in 911, in, in the regulatory environment of 911. There's federal statute involved. The FCC plays a huge role. The Public Utilities Commission, which is a state level body, but it is on the test. Uh, if you look through the, the body of knowledge, they do list public utilities commissions. We're going to talk about how they differ from state to state and a little bit about the Department of Justice because they do play a, a role in how 911 uh, call centers operate. Then we're going to go into some special legislative areas including public information laws, confidentiality and privacy laws, liability and sovereign immunity, emergency medical dispatching, nuisance, false, and automatic alarm legislation, mass or emergency notification systems, bidding and purchasing laws. Now, if you were following along in the body of knowledge, you'll notice that the order that I listed my stuff is not quite quite identical to what's in the body of knowledge. The grouping was kind of weird how they had it in there, but I do cover everything that was listed, uh, I think. And if I miss anything, please uh, feel free to ask me questions at the end. So what we will not cover, uh, just so that there are no misunderstandings, we're not really going to go into a whole lot of detail about how things work specifically here in Colorado. 
you would think that would be what would be the most pertinent to you, but they write those tests, the certification tests, for a national audience, so they don't get into a lot of really state-specific stuff. So I might talk about how things are done in Colorado occasionally as an example or to give you an idea of, of, of how to apply a concept, but we won't be going into a lot of detail on that because that will not be on your test. Um, and there's a separate session uh, that will be, hand, that will be uh, uh, done later that handles legislation and regulation affecting employee relations. Uh, so anything related to how to, um, the, the, concerning law regarding selection, uh, hiring, termination of, of employees, that'll all be handled in a, in a different session. So today we're really going to be focusing on 911 technology and legislation and regulation. Um, all of that being said, before I get into this, the first slide with actual content on it here, um, all of this, if you look at that body of knowledge, everything that I'm going over today is worth 5% of the test. So I'm going to be throwing a whole lot of stuff at you, and I don't want you to, to panic thinking there's no way I'm going to memorize all this. It's only worth 5% of the test. But, on the other hand, 5% is 5%, and it might be that 5% that, that means the difference between a passing and, and failing grade on the, on the exam. So. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you to not pay attention or anything, but I also don't, don't, want, to, don't want you to panic and think there's no way that I'm going to remember all this because there is a lot of stuff that they have us cover in this section. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the, the funding mechanisms and sources for uh, 911. Um, first thing we'll talk about are the telephone surcharges and levies. So a surcharge is an additional charge that's added on to a product or service. It's not exactly the same thing as a, te a tax. I think I put that in here, right? Uh, yeah, they're, no, they're taxes. Uh, they're different than certain taxes in that they are applied to specific products or services, and the revenue from a surcharge is set aside for a specific purpose, whereas taxes go into a general fund can be used for a, a number of different uh, of, of, uh, uh, purposes. A levy is a... Is a is like a surcharge except it's applied to the provider and not the customer. You will generally not see levies used to fund 911 uh, 911 services in the United States. It's usually a surcharge. Almost every state has a 911 surcharge of some sort, uh, or they let the local governments do like they do here in Colorado. So surcharges are really the primary method by which the capital costs of 911 are paid for. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but capital costs are your big, your big uh, ticket purchases, your 911 phone system, your CAD system. It's usually equipment or facilities. Operational costs are your ongoing everyday costs, including personnel costs, uh, paying the electric bill, things like that, things that you have to pay every month or on an ongoing basis. So surcharges are usually used to pay for capital costs, those big ticket items. We'll talk a little bit more about where the rest of the money comes from. So most states have a 911 surcharge applied to telephone bills. How much the surcharge is and what type of services are surcharged varies from state to state. So some there are states that don't have any surcharge. There are states that have surcharges only on landlines. There are states that have surcharges on landlines and wireless and they're two different rates. So it varies. Every state does it a little bit differently. Um, and uh, what you see is they're all over the board as far as the rate, too. You see some as low as 40 cents, some as high as $3. You know, and here in Colorado, they're set at the local level, and, and, and our lowest is 43 and goes up to $1.50. So we're kind of in the middle of that, that range, but what you see from state to state is that it varies widely. Wireless surcharges, some states, as I mentioned, apply a different surcharge uh, to different forms of telecommunications. They may have a 50 cent uh, landline surcharge and a 75 cent wireless surcharge. They may even go to different places. There may be a 911 board that handles the money from the landline surcharge and a wireless 911 board that handles the money from the wireless surcharge. Uh, Colorado requires local 911 authorities to apply the same surcharge across the board. So whatever you charge for landline is the same you char as you charge for wireless and VoIP. That's actually in state statute. Uh, local governments can set their, their own surcharge, but they, ha they have to do it um, equally for all three types of devices. Prepaid wireless surcharges is a topic that's come up um, really just in the last few years, 
but uh, there are a lot of states that do not yet have prepaid wireless surcharges. So if you buy a prepaid phone with prepaid minutes, you're not actually paying into the 911 system that you could potentially use. Uh, a number of states have started to apply uh, uh, prepaid wireless surcharges, including Colorado. We have a 1.4 POS surcharge, which means point of sale. It means It means that when the customer goes to buy the phone or buy the minutes at the retailer, there's a 1.4% a surcharge added on top of that. Some states have a flat rate that they charge instead of a percentage, and some states require the carriers to actually pay a surcharge on the customer's behalf every month that the person has a balance. Um, that's probably one of the, 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 the rarer forms of doing it, but there are some, some states that have decided not to do it at the retail level. Yes? Are they paying for that just when they buy a phone or every time they purchase minutes? The question was, do they pay for that when they buy the phone or every time they purchase minutes? And the way ours is structured, it's every time they purchase minutes. And it's supposed to be for online ret retailers as well, but that's a lot harder to police, so we don't. it's kind of hard to say what the um, compliance level is. Uh, and the rate varies. I think 1.4, which is ours, is actually the lowest of the states that have the point of sale. Some of them go as high as 2%. Daryl, can, uh, yes. can you tell us who's responsible for monitoring and making sure that those are collected appropriately? The question was, who is responsible for monitoring and making sure those are collected appropriately? And again, that will vary from state to state. In Colorado, it's the uh, Department of Revenue. They, have, they treat it like a sales tax, essentially. So they collect it and, and uh, they keep their cut. Keep their cut, exactly. And they, have to, they cover their administrative expenses. And then uh, it's up to them to do the audits uh, to make sure that people are paying it the way they're supposed to be. How do they determine who that gets distributed to? The question was, how do they determine who it gets distributed to? What they did was, uh, and this is in the statute, every wireless 911 authority in the state, they determine how many uh, wireless calls they're responsible for, and they know how many wireless calls are taken across the state. And so each 911 authority gets a percentage that's essentially how many wireless calls they take divided by the total statewide. So it's proportional to how many wireless calls you take. Um, Taxes are another way that 911 can be funded. It's not as common as surcharges, but some local governments have opted to supplement 911 funding with sales taxes or property taxes. Sales taxes are more common. Some examples are uh, New Mexico, uh, one of the last places I worked. Uh, New Mexico allows local governments uh, to apply, and they have to get this approved by the voters, but they, they're allowed to apply what's called a gross receipts tax, which is like a sales tax except it applies to more things like rent and, and uh, other services that wouldn't normally be covered under a uh, sales tax. And that can be used for public safety purposes, including 911. So uh, that's, one, that's one example of, of local governments using sales taxes to pay for 911. And that's one way they can fund operational costs. Remember I said the 911 surcharges on telephones tend to be used almost exclusively for equipment costs, for, for capital costs. So to cover that other part of it, which is frankly the more expensive part, the people, you know, your personnel costs are always the, the highest, um, that's one way they, they've come up with to, uh, to help the local governments do that. Green County, Missouri, uh, again that's um, uh, an old stomping ground of mine, but after I left they got a sales tax passed and it was one with a sunset, so it wasn't ongoing like the one in New Mexico that lasts forever. It only lasted for a few years, but during those, those few years they raised $4 million and it was enough for them to build a new, um, a new uh, dispatch center in EOC. So that's another example of a, of a local government using sales taxes to uh, supplement their, um, their, 911, uh, their 911 system. And in that case, they were using it specifically for capital costs, right? They weren't paying for personnel with it. They wanted to, bu to bu uh, build a new uh, dispatch center. So that's what they put the uh, sales tax out there to do. Another way that 911 can be funded is through government funding, as federal, state, and local governments can subsidize 911 service in a number of different ways. Grants is one way, and we're going to talk a little bit more about grants here in a little bit. Um, they can come from the federal government or the state. They're usually for capital costs, one-time costs. They're usually for a specific project. Earmarks can come from the federal government or the state. Earmarks for 911 from the federal side, I don't think I've ever seen one. Technically, it could happen. Um, most people think have heard of this. They, uh, the, the derogatory name for it is pork spending. 
pork barrel spending. This is basically when your senator or congressman go and they insert line items into the budget at the state or federal level saying, I want, in the, in the state budget this year, I want uh, to pay for a, a new dispatch center for a county in my home district. And if the budget gets passed, then that, that uh, item gets funded. It's almost, like, it's almost like a grant without having an actual grant program to, to, to have it in. Uh, those are pretty rare anymore, uh, especially since uh, really around 2008 when the, when, this, when the recession hit and people started watching earmarks and things like that a lot more closely. Uh, I know of one in New Mexico when I was working there, but I haven't heard of any in, in Colorado since I came here. Loans are available from the federal government uh, at low or no interest rate for specific for specific specific for specific types of communities. Usually, rural communities. The USDA has a low a low interest loan program that can, has been and can sometimes be used for 911 projects. It's essentially to help uh, rural communities build up their local infrastructure. So you can you if you as long as you can prove that you can pay off the loan in, in the long run. Uh, they'll give you a loan for uh, building a new dispatch center or something along those lines. Um, there are programs out there, and states can have programs in 911. Colorado does not have a 911 program, but a lot of states do have a 911 office or something along those lines. And the federal government has a national 911 program office. Those don't provide money to local 911 services directly, but they try. They, they exist to sort of help in other ways, like collecting information, uh, maybe helping coordinate the application for grants and things like that. Is that like the Colorado 911 Resource? Well, the Colorado 911 Resource Center is a nonprofit. We're not a state agency, so we wouldn't technically fall under that. But you know, we because Colorado doesn't have one, that's kind of one of the reasons we were created, right? Um, and general funds of county and city governments. This is actually where the vast majority of funds for the operational costs of 911 come from. Um, you can, in Colorado, use 911 surcharges to pay for personnel, but most 911 authorities don't. Or if they do, they only pay for like one or two employees, and then the rest have to be kept, uh, picked up. So the county and the city governments are paying for it out of their general funds. Uh, a lot of times you'll have multiple agencies dispatched out of one place, and each agency may pay based on a formula may have to pay a membership fee to the dispatch center. And that's how the dispatch center gets its funding for operational costs. So that's really, whenever we talk about, um, whenever we talk about 911 surcharges, one of the things I try to, to keep in people's minds is that anything we do that keeps those surcharges low is just increasing the burden on the city and county government because that money has to come from somewhere, right? So. It's, it's either you pay now or you pay later. You pay through the surcharge or you pay through your, uh, your local city or county taxes. Uh, going back to grants. Um, you have a question over there. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, you might answer it. Why, uh, why are there not any private grants from, um, from like, I don't know, AT&T, Verizon, you know, something, something like that to help why are there no private grants from AT&T or Verizon or, or similar types of telecommunications carriers? Um, well, uh, this is going to sound cynical. Primarily the reason is because they're in the business of making money from us, not giving money to us. <laughs> they're trying to sell us services for the most part. And, you know, those companies, a lot, most corporations give, give a lot of money away. It's usually, you know, there's a, there's, there's a reason why they do it, and it's, it's usually to engender goodwill, um, so they give money to charities and things like that, but giving money to government agencies I don't think usually falls on their radar. You know, maybe if we had a, a representative from AT&T, we might get one during the course of these sessions and we can ask them, you know, is that something that you guys have ever would ever consider? Um, but generally speaking, the grants come from federal grants or the state. There are no ongoing grant programs for 911 projects right now. Um, you might hear a lot of a lot of people say, "Well, we should be able to find a grant to pay for this." There just really are not a lot of grant programs that come out for 911 specifically. However, there are grant programs that can be used for 911. They're just not made specifically for 911. DHS FEMA grants, DHS Homeland Sec Department of Homeland Security, FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, there was a lot more money in those grants available following the first few years after 9-11. You 
It's kind of dried up in the last few years, and you're in competition with a whole lot of agencies. Um, and f a lot of those agencies are first responder agencies, so police departments wanting equipment for their officers, fire fire departments wanting trucks and things like that. It's a hard it's a hard field to get into, but um, it is technically eligible for 911, and especially for interoperability projects, and, you know, radio and things like that. Um, to be eligible for that, you have to do that through your state coordinator. Each state has a DHS coordinator for their grants. In Colorado, it's the uh, Office of Emergency Management, so it kind of has to go through them. So it's not impossible. In fact, I got a, a grant to expand my call center when I was the PSAP manager in New Mexico under a Homeland Security grant. Basically, we got a grant for, um, uh, to, for facility hardening. We made the facility a lot more secure and added outside cameras and added a training room, uh, you know, which was nice, but uh, it was because I had a, uh, a county emergency manager who was really, really good at navigating the system, and that's kind of what you have to have. States will sometimes have grants um, that varies from state to state. Because it varies from state to state, there won't be questions on your exam about specific grant programs. Just to give you an example, though, in Colorado, there's one called the um, Energy Impact Grants. These are in counties that have a lot of um, oil and gas operations going on in them. Uh, the companies that do those have to pay into a fund that's supposed to reimburse the community for some of the damages that occur just naturally through the process of, of developing oil and gas. And then the community can apply for grants through that. And I do know that there are uh, call centers in Colorado that have applied for grants through the Energy Impact Grant Program. So that's one in Colorado and in New Mexico. It's kind of interesting. All the surcharge funds in the state, because they're collected at the state level, that goes into a fund that's then used to uh, uh, pay for a grant program, and that's how they get their equipment in Colorado. If you want a new phone system, in, or excuse me, not Colorado, in New Mexico, if you want a new phone system in New Mexico, you have to apply for a grant from the, uh, the New Mexico uh, Department of Finance and Administration, and that's how they get get the funds back from their 911 surcharges. So there's lots of different ways to do it, and those, those are just a couple of examples of how grant programs can be run at the state level for 911. Some things to consider regarding 911 funding. Um, each state has its own limits on how 911 surcharge revenues can be spent. It's either in the statute or it's in some set of rules, either through their utility commission or through their 911 board or something along those lines. In Colorado, it's in statute. There is a statute in Colorado that says exactly what uh, 911 surcharge funds can be spent on. It's pretty broad, so it can be spent on a lot of different types of things uh, and somewhat open to interpretation. Um, but there is a there is a statute that, that lists that. The federal government has, um, since 2004, has made it a, any, any grant that they put out for 911, the last one was the uh, Enhanced 911 Act of 2004, there was a grant program in that. They, you had to uh, essentially state officially that your state does not divert 911 funds from their intended purposes. And the reason is because the number of states have done that. Uh, uh, I think Arizona is the worst. They've probably they've they've rated their 9, their state 911 fund for about 40 million dollars, basically to help balance the the state's general fund budget. Uh, state of New York has done it, state of Illinois, um, they tried to do it in Hawaii, but the Hawaii Attorney General basically shut them down and told them they couldn't do that. So a number of states have done this or tried to do this, and the federal government saw this as a problem, the FCC saw this as a problem. So when the Enhanced 911 Act was written, it was written into it that you had to, that you had to, to be eligible for the grant money, you had to state that you had not uh, diverted any money. Here in Colorado, we don't have a state 911 fund, so it doesn't really apply to us. It's all, it's all at the local level. The state does not have the ability to divert 911 funds because we don't have 911 funds at the state level. Um, collection and distribution methods. Uh, there are lots of different ways 911 for surcharge funds are collected. Uh, most states that have a surcharge fund collect at the state level. Colorado is one of the few ones that allow the locals to collect directly, so it doesn't go through the state at all, except for the prepaid surcharge funds, which we talked about earlier. But the, the rest of them, landline, wireless, and VoIP, the carriers all remit directly to the local 911 authority. If they're direct, if they're um, remitted to the state, 
then they have to get that money back to the local government somehow. And so the, there's a distribution method involved, and those vary from state to state as well. In some states, they just divvy it up based on a formula. So how many people you have in your county, it might be on a sliding scale to help out the, the smaller uh, communities. How many there, 911 calls you take? How many 911 calls you take. Um, sometimes this, the formula is very simple, like just straight based on population. Sometimes it's complicated. It might take in population. It might take in call load. Uh, North Carolina probably has the, the most complicated one I've heard of. I think they take in uh, population, call load, and how much money you have needed in the last five years as an average. Uh, they kind of take all that into consideration. It's a very complicated formula. Um, so that's a formula-based, direct to local authorities, basically, what we have here, because this, it never goes through the state. So everything that you collect is what has been collected from the citizens in your local 911 authority area. So that's direct to local authority. And then there's managed distri distribution. I talked about what New Mexico does. They don't care how much you collected from your citizens. What they care about is that grant application that you, that you send in, trying to get money from the fund to pay for your equipment. So there, those are really the three different ways that you can distribute 911 funds. Requirements. Um, and I think the reason why this was in this section, it kind of it kind of threw me because I was like, what does that have to do with, with funding? But I think what it has to do with is that there are states where the local PSAP has to meet certain state requirements in order to be eligible for funding. Uh, so that's that's probably what the, the uh, um, what the tie-in is there. But what you have to realize is that there are no federal standards for how 911 service is delivered. If there are standards, all of those standards exist at the state level. Some states have some fairly extensive 911 standards. Some states do not. By now, you're probably seeing a, uh, a pattern. Colorado does not have standards. We don't have standards for uh, what kind of equipment is in the call center. Uh, we don't have requirements concerning EMD. We don't have training or certification requirements. Uh, we don't have standards for addressing and mapping. So all of that is up to the local government in Colorado. In other states, they make those standards statewide. Uh, in, 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 I won't say every other state, but in a lot of states, they make those standards statewide, at least on some of those items. So for equipment and service level, for instance, they might have a standard that says you have to have at least two dispatchers on duty um, 24-7, 365 in order to be eligible for funds. Uh, Colorado doesn't have that requirement. In fact, there are some single seat dispatch centers still left in Colorado. Um, there might be addressing uh, and mapping requirements. In order to be eligible for uh, funds for GIS projects for 911, you have to um, be working towards a 96% or 98% accuracy rate on your, on your GIS data. Um, in order to be eligible for training funds, you have to do EMD and, and uh, and meet uh, a certain set of requirements there. So, you know, I gave an example. Colorado has no has none of those standards at the state level. Probably the state that's most complicated in their set of sets of standards is Florida. They have really extensive training standards. Yes. I thought that they have quite a few standards at this radio-wise. Those would be set by the CCNC or the governing body of the radio system. And the question was, aren't there a lot of standards regarding radio and there very well could be. You know, my, my focus tends to be more on the, the 911 side, and not the radio side. But you know, through CCNC and and, yeah. and, and we're a different system now. Right. The, the FRCC. So. The FRCC. And so you know, depending on what what radio network you're part of, there will be standards mm -hmm. related to that. Yes, sir. Do you think um, having state requirements makes a state more efficient than just having no standards? The question was, does having state requirements make a state more efficient than having no standards at all? Um, you know, that's a, that's almost a political statement, <laughs> uh, a political question. I think it depends on, you know, what what it is you're trying to accomplish. You know, and Colorado has a, a long, strong history of local control, and local local agencies like to have a lot of control over how they deliver 911 service. Um, other states have decided that they would rather have uniformity or um, a consistency of service across their entire across all their jurisdictions. So it really depends on which of those things you think is more of a a a, a benefit uh, value to the community. And so rather than giving you an answer one way or the other, I'll just give you that to think about. And okay. 
you know, because it's a matter of opinion, really. The question was, was there a current conversation about trying to reach standards uh, in Colorado? The answer is, um, to some degree, yes. It, there is a training standards committee that's working on training standards right now. However, at this point, they're looking at voluntary training standards only. So it still wouldn't be a statewide standard. It would be more of a voluntary, this is a program that you can participate in uh, if you can't do a training program on your own. And who's publishing or presenting that? Well, there's, yeah, well, there's a there's a committee that meets once a month, um, and it's run by uh, Monica Million from Grand Junction, who you've met because she was here, and Kim Carroll from Denver. Um, but they have training uh, coordinators from almost every call center in the state participating one way or another. And uh, they've actually made a lot of progress. And, and they're not a resource center committee. We don't run the meetings or anything like that, but we do uh, host a website, a web page form. So if you go to resources, no, you go to groups and committees and then click on training standards committee, you can kind of get a, a, an overview of everything, <clears throat> excuse me, of everything that they've done so far and have been working on. Can you speak to the EMD standards introduced to legislation this year? Uh, sure. Well, actually, there's a whole section on EMD later, so I'll get to that. Um, if, 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 are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'll move on because we still got a lot to Just cover Just one here. comment. Sure. Um, I think for federal grants, they want comm centers to, dispatchers still have the ICS 700, 800, or you don't even qualify for a federal grant. But as Daryl said, there are few and far in between. There's no funds out there right now, but they want a, uh, communication centers, dispatchers to have taken those ICS courses. Right, that's for the DHS, FEMA grants, yeah. And that's one thing about grants, too, that you probably ought to know is that there are almost always strings attached. There are requirements and hoops that you have to jump through, things that you have to do to be eligible for the grant in the first place. So in this section, we're going to be going through a number of different laws. And this is a rote memorization thing. Um, and I, I, I wish I had an easier thing, a way to tell you to, to, to get this down easier for, um, for the exam. I guarantee that at least flashcards are good. I guarantee at least one or two of these will probably be on the exam because they like covering these. Um, but there are a number of different federal acts that have um, been passed and, and signed into law over the years that have an effect of, on 911 service at the local level. And they like us to know this for these exams. The first one is the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And it is what you would call a foundational law. It doesn't cover 911 in a whole lot of detail specifically. It covers a lot of things that uh, deal with the telecommunications industry more generally. Um, however, it is the, you know, if you're going to build a house and all of these are the different parts of the house, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is the floor, right? You can't build anything else until you build, the, until you build that foundation. So everything else that came after that really builds on to that or, or makes makes adjustments to it, um, including all of the ones that are specific to 911. The next one that came after that is the Wireless Communications and Public Safety Act of 1999, the short name of that, because they like giving these really long names that they have to give them nicknames because otherwise they'd never get through a session of Congress. The short name for that is just the 911 Act. So if you hear anyone say the 911 Act, not any of these other enhanced 911, next gen 911, any of those, just the 911 Act. That's the act that came out in 1999. It's an important one because it's the one that designates 911 officially as the emergency number of the United States. Um, you know, 911's been around a lot longer than that. It was actually the first 911 call was made in 1968. So it took a long time for it to become official that 911 became the emergency number of the United States. It also gave the FCC the right to regulate 911 issues on the public switch telephone network. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, the Enhanced 911 Act of 2004 came after that. I talked about that one a little bit already. That's the one that created the National 911 Program Office. Before then, there was no agency of the federal government that was tasked with uh, keeping up with what was happening in 911. It also created a grant program, which is now expired, unfortunately. Um, and it was authorized to give $250 million a year to the states to help improve 911 infrastructure. 
Uh, unfortunately, there's a difference between authorization and appropriation, and so only $43 million total was appropriated uh, under that grant program. So that gives you kind of an idea of some of the, you, you can think, oh great, we got this, this, uh, we got this uh, $400 million four-year grant program, and you end up getting just a little over 10% of it actually out of, out of Congress. The Net 911 Act improvement of 2008, um, it re that's the act that requires the FCC to report to Congress every year on how 911 funds are spent by the states. So every year, every state governor gets a letter from the FCC saying, we want to know these things about your 911 program. How much money did you collect? Was any of it diverted? What can it be spent on? And so on. Um, in Colorado, because we don't have a 911 office, it usually goes to the governor's office, then it eventually makes its way over the PUC, and then the PUC has asked me for the last several years to fill that out for them. Um, so that's actually been filled out by, by my office. And it also confirmed the FCC's authority to regulate 911 for VoIP carriers. VoIP is Voice Over Internet Protocol. So that's a telephone system basically that you receive calls that are sent over an IP network. There was question at the time as to whether the FCC had the right to regulate VoIP providers when it came to 911. And the, the Net 911 Act is the act that says, yes, they definitely are authorized to do that. Uh, Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. And you're thinking, what the heck does that have to do with 911? That was a really, really huge bill. Uh, you might have re uh, heard it. What was the name? What were they calling it at the time? It was the... Um, Probably Job Creation Act. Yeah. Well, there was a... Well, anyway, it, this came after... Um, you know, this after several years of the economy recovering very slowly from 2008. Uh, so the, the main purpose of the bill was to uh, try to help the economy, but there was a rider included in it, and you will you might hear the rider referred to by its own name, which is kind of confusing, but it also had a name. That was the Next Generation 911 Advancement Act. And that rider... Um, created funding for public safety communications, including FirstNet, which I'm hoping that you'll learn more about uh, during these other sessions. That's basically a, a idea of building a public safety broadband network nationwide, but also for next generation 911. That grant program will not be funded until after the sale of Radio Spectrum to pay for it. So that'll be several years before we actually see the money from that, but it does create that grant program for us. And again, I have the name of it, the name of that writer down here, that amendment um, that was included in that act is the Next Generation 911 Advancement Act of 2012. So acts can have acts. That was the Payroll Tax Cut Act. Payroll, ta payroll Tax Cut Act, okay. That's where we all got $13 on the paycheck. Yeah, and then it went away. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Federal Communications Commission is probably the, the body at the federal level that is most involved in 911 issues, there are others, but the one that's most involved in 911 issues is probably the FCC, uh, because under that 1999 act, remember, the, the 911 act, the FCC was officially given the authority to regulate 911 issues. Um, they regulate the public switch telephone network, also known as the PSTN, now we're back into our acronym soup here. Um, they they regulate all wireless spectrum, communication spectrum. They're the ones that make sure that when you're listening to a radio station, a neighboring radio station can't butt in by just turning up the, the uh, power on their transmitter. They regulate cellular providers because that's how they work, is through the radio system. And they regulate, to some extent, voice over internet protocol providers that interconnect with the PSTN. So what does that mean? Vonage, you can call a regular phone number from Vonage. Even though it's, an, it's even though it's an IP-based phone, right? So if you have a Vonage phone, you call somebody with a regular phone. It basically is translating at some point that call from an IP network to the PSTN. Um, anything that inter interconnects with the PSTN is part of the FCC's jurisdiction. Um, the FCC has the right to regulate 901 for any of the types of providers above. Uh, however, they do not regulate 911 service, how 911 service is delivered by the state and local governments. So the thing to th keep in mind here is they don't tell local call centers what to do. They don't tell PSAPs what to do. If they could, they probably would have already t ordered us to start accepting text to 911 because they want us to. 
but they don't have jurisdiction to do so because their jurisdiction is over the carriers, not over local uh, government agencies. Uh, here's some things that the FCC does regarding 911 that affect us. Um, they require the PSTN providers, that's your CenturyLink, your, um, well, your old Ma Bells, oh, there's a whole bunch of, of little um, rural telecommunicators in Colorado, uh, telecommunicators, tele, telecommunications companies, telecoms in Colorado. It requires them all to work together to deliver 911 calls. Uh, so if somebody calls 911 and it has to pass through more than one um, telecommunications carrier in order to be received by the PSAP, then they're required by the rules of the FCC to make that happen. This includes, and I remember this, these acronyms being on my test, since every, there are several different versions of the test and they've changed since then, I don't know if they still will be, but ILECs are incumbent local exchange carriers, and ILEC is a telecommunications landline company that has its own equipment that's delivering calls across its own network. A competitive local exchange carrier is a telecommunications company that doesn't have its own network. It's leasing uh, network time from one of the ILEX. So those are, those are two different things that the FCC regulates. In regards to 911, they make sure that you can call 911 regardless of which telephone company you're using. Uh, requires cell service providers to deliver ni all 911 calls received, whether the caller is a customer or not. So if you're roaming and you call 911, they can't say, well, he's not paying me a month with his, with his monthly fee, so I'm not going to deliver his 911 call. By FCC rule, they have to deliver it. In fact, if you have no contract at all on your phone, or if it's a prepaid phone that you've run out of minutes on, they still, by FCC rule, have to deliver that call to the PSAP, which is why you get all of those those lovely uh, calls from uh, prepaid phones that no longer have minutes so you can't call them back. Uh, establishes location accuracy requirements for cell service providers. So ever since the uh, uh, 2005 when they first set the, the first uh, location accuracy requirements for wireless enhanced 911, it's the FCC that does that. And they're the ones that say that it has to be within 150 meters 66% um, of the time. No, 150 meters 90% of the time, 50 meters, 67% of the time, or something along those lines. They require all interconnected VoIP providers to deliver 911 calls. I remember when this one started and they were concerned about how Vonage and, and the other companies that were doing business at the time, Comcast is one of the biggest ones now, were going to be able to deliver uh, address and subscriber information on an alley screen, uh, even though it's coming across a VoIP phone, but they made it happen. They're currently working on text to 911 requirements for carriers. Again, not for us, but for carriers. So they're they're the ones that are going to set the standards for what the what how text to 911 will work at the carrier level. They monitor 911 service outages at a national level. Uh, they manage the telecommunications service priority program, and that was actually on the list and the body of knowledge. The telecommunications service priority program um, is a program that local call centers can sign up for it. You have to actually register for it. But if you register for it, then your call center will get a higher list of, a higher level of priority when the local telecommunications company is turning back on their service after an outage. So let's say there's an outage that affects all of Weld County, assuming that the Weld County Regional Communications Center is on the TSP program, which I'm assuming it probably is, then CenturyLink is required under the TSP program to try to get you guys up and running before they work on anything else. Um, and they research and provide information about next generation 911. So they do a lot involved in 911 that eventually trickles down and affects us at the local level. Public Utilities Commission, each state has its own regulatory agency for telecommunications. Each one's a little bit different, which is why I'm guessing there probably won't be a whole lot of this on your test. In they even go by different names. In Colorado, it is a Public Utilities Commission. In New Mexico, it's a Public Regulatory Commission. I think there are other names that they go by. It's essentially a body in each state that regulates local utilities, including telecommunications. Um, and they each have varying uh, degrees of authority on regulating 911 service. In Colorado, the PUC has the right to regulate um, local carriers. They also have, we also have something unique here in Colorado called the Basic Emergency Service Provider. Um, that essentially means that the, if the company wants to deliver 911 calls to a call center, they have to get certified by the PUC to do so. 
Uh, they approve tariffs. That's another thing those regulatory commissions do, or utility commissions. A uh, tariff is basically a rule that sets the uh, prices for certain types of services. So CenturyLink will say, okay, uh, we're going to put it in writing that we will provide 911 service to call centers for X dollars or X dollars per record. In Colorado, it's like, uh, I want to say, nine cents for every uh, record you have in the Alley database. And that gets written into a tariff, which is then approved by the PUC. So they can't charge you anything other than that until the tariff changes. Department of Justice has a, a couple of different things that they do regarding 911. Uh, one is that they, re if you have, if you're a law enforcement dispatch center, which most dispatch centers are, at least to some degree, and have access to NCIC, there are certain DOJ security requirements that a call center has to go has to has to uh, has to meet. Um, I can't tell you right off the top of my head what they all are. I know one of them is that you have to have um, dual authentication. Yeah, you have to have specific lines uh, for transmitting NCIC data that are not intermi intermixed with internet traffic because they don't want people to be able to, to hack the, uh, the communications. Um, and DOJ is also the federal agency that enforces the Americans with Disabilities Act as it applies to state and local governments. So the AD under the ADA, uh, the DOJ can tell Local governments, you are not meeting the Americans with Disabilities Act. Here are some things you need to do to start to get into compliance. One of the things they require is that every PSAP in the country has to have the ability to receive TDD or TTY calls. Are they looking at changing that, considering that I would say the majority of the phone calls that we get from the hearing impaired are no longer from those devices? Right. They're looking at more of a video relay versus the NG. The next generation so the question is, are they thinking of changing that because the majority of calls we receive from the hearing impaired are no longer from TDD devices? And the answer is yes. They've uh, already had some workshops on this. Um, my guess is eventually they're going to require text to 911 for that purpose because most people who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, use texting as their primary method of communication. The reason they don't require it is because if you requ DOJ requires it, they might have to pay for it, which is why they regulate the carriers more than they do the PSAPs, because they're not going to dish out money. So they suggest. Well, they, they've never, they never paid for TDD devices yeah. either. Um, my guess is they're waiting until all the carriers are capable of, of text to 911, which is something the FCC is working on right now. So after the FCC does their thing, it makes it a requirement for all carriers. My guess is the PSAPs will be next from the DOJ. That's just my yeah. my guess, my educated guess, but for most I wouldn't be surprised. For most communities, uh, TDD is dead technology. That's right, TDD. And so probably the same rules that require text and 911 will say you're no longer required to do TT TDD because it's almost never used anymore. Now we're into the, our special legislative areas. Um, the first one we're going to talk about are public information laws. You might more commonly, and that's, I put, the, I, I put that on there because that's the way it was listed in the body of knowledge, but I more commonly hear them referred to as open records requests or open records laws. Um, I've also heard them referred to as FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. Freedom of Information Act is technically the federal version of that. It doesn't apply to state and local governments, but a lot of people don't know the difference, so they may say they're going to make a FOIA request. What they really mean is they're going to make an open records request. Almost every state, probably possibly every state, has some sort of open records law. It requires state and local government to provide records to people who request it. This is all about transparency in government, making sure that people know what their government's up to. Um, there are exceptions that are usually written into that law. Colorado has exceptions written into it. You do not have to release any record, for instance, that uh, pertains to an ongoing criminal investigation because you'd be basically giving out information that law enforcement is currently using to try to solve a crime, right? So that's one example. Um, medical information is usually excluded. Personnel records, to some degree, are excluded. It, it kind of varies from state to state. Um, information that could be used for identity theft. So, you know, you guys, most of you guys probably do direct deposit through here, right? So somewhere, Weld County has a list of all your bank account numbers and social security numbers. So if anybody could request anything, they could go to Weld County and say, I want a list of all your employees with their social security numbers and bank account numbers. 
Well, obviously that's one of the reasons why they have to have an exception built into these laws so that people can't do things like that. HIPAA is a, uh, a privacy or confidentiality law. HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. A lot of people, including myself from time to time, misspell it as H-I-P-P-A. It's actually H-I-P-A-A. So you, want, you may, try, may try to spell it HIPPO, but it's, it's HIPPO with two A's. And it's essentially, it's a federal law that also applies to state and local governments, as well as to hospitals and, and any provider of medical services. And it, it prohibits the release of medical information without the permission of the patient, is essentially what it comes down to, with a lot, with a lot of details kind of written in there. There has been a lot of... Um, differing opinions as to whether HIPAA applies to dispatch centers. I've heard people say that it doesn't. I've heard people say that it does. Uh, one of the arguments against saying that it doesn't, uh, in favor of saying that it doesn't, is that uh, that HIPAA was written to apply to people who give hands-on care to patients or who do billing for patients. Um, so in, in, if, if you follow that theory, then some dispatch centers that do billing for ambulance companies might be uh, covered and some uh, other dispatch centers wouldn't be. But since it's, it's, a, it's not a clear picture as to whether HIPAA applies to dispatch centers or not, one of the best things you can do is just go ahead and follow it, which, is, which means don't give out medical information that you don't have to. Uh, the law has made it fairly clear that dispatch centers can give medical information out over the radio if it's related to dispatching call. If you have to give it out to get, get care to a patient, then you are, you are allowed legally to give that information out. But what I would argue is that you should be careful not to give out any information that's not relevant to the call. So you, you have a, um, you have a, a um, domestic dispute at a house, and you're dispatching it out, and you look back through the history, and you tell the officer that the guy, had a, the, the guy in the house had a heart attack three years ago. Not relevant, right? You're giving out medical information that has absolutely nothing to do with the current call. The, the real question comes in with cont uh, um, contagious diseases, HIV, hepatitis, things like that. You want to protect your, your units, you want to protect your officers. That information should still not be given out over the air. If there's any way else you can give it to them, that's one thing. But you also need to keep in mind that all first responders are trained to use universal precautions. They should be wearing gloves. They should, be, they should know not to touch bodily fluids um, if they can avoid it. Um, so... Really, the, the best thing to do is just to avoid the, the, uh, the danger of, of running afoul of this or other medical privacy laws. Yes? Have you, have you heard of any PSAP anywhere violating HIPAA or getting any sort of consequences from HIPAA? I couldn't tell you details right offhand. I do remember reading an article last year. Prior to that, I thought, because everything I read said that HIPAA does not apply to dispatch centers, but last year there was a... Um, a dispatch center out east, and I can get you more information on that after I look it up again, that uh, was sued for a HIPAA violation, and they, it still isn't clear whether they were covered or not because they settled. Uh, if they'd gone to court, they might have, the court might have said that they weren't covered, but the dispatcher was clearly in violation of, of confidentiality in this case because he was giving out information that he really shouldn't have. Um, 911 privacy laws. There are no federal laws concerning privacy of 911 calls, and I think most people would really be shocked to learn this, that any call you make to 911 is suddenly a, pri a public record. It doesn't matter how embarrassing it is or, or uh, you know, what the circumstances are, it's, it's a public record. Um, some states have, have enacted laws in recent years limiting the release of 911 calls. Uh, Connecticut was looking at this because, they, because of the... Um, controversy of releasing all the 911 calls related to the, the Newtown, Connecticut uh, shooting. Um, Illinois recently passed a law, and this is just this last year, that made it a crime for PSAP personnel to um, tip off criminals <laughs> with police information. You'd think that would, um, that would already be against the law, which it probably would be under aiding and abetting or um, uh, hampering a police investigation, but they made it a specifically a law to... Um, to give 911 information gathered at a 911 call center to a criminal. Um, confidentiality, even though it's not a, even though it's not against the law to give out 911 information in a lot of in a lot of cases, 
Confidentiality is usually a condition of employment with PSAPs, and you, uh, you, even if you can't be found criminally liable, you can be terminated. Uh, so that's uh, that's really where the state of privacy laws are, are in the country. But a number of states have started looking at um, providing some level of privacy protection for 911 callers, uh, especially as more and more calls are being made public and broadcast on the news and radio. They don't want people to think, well, I should call 911, but I'm not going to because I don't want to end up on the 10 o'clock news. Liability and the, t the concept of sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity is a legal concept. Of course, sovereign is a word that means ruler. It goes back to the old monarch days. Sovereign immunity is the concept that the government, the king, or is where the word sovereign comes from, that the government cannot be sued. Um, this is often a limited form of immunity. Uh, so you, most governments, uh, including the federal government and most state governments, provide themselves with a degree of sovereign immunity, saying we cannot be sued except in these cases, and then they list specific cases. Most states have laws, and Colorado does as well, limiting liability of PSAP personnel who act in good faith. So if you do the best job you can, you're following the, the, the uh, procedures the best you can, you're following your training, and you make a mistake, you're not liable for it. Uh, you can still be sued, but chances are you they won't win. That's basically what it comes down to, because they have to prove certain things uh, in order to sue you uh, effectively in Colorado as well as most states. And those exceptions are gross or wanton negligence, and the exact terminology changes from state to state. Gross negligence, sometimes you hear wanton negligence, that's W-A-N-T-O-N, not W-O-N-T-O-N, because it's, it's not a soup. Uh, but gross or wanton negligence basically means careless, reckless carelessness. You know what to do, you just you just don't care. It's the end of your shift. Um, I got this call from this guy, he wanted to report his bicycle stolen. Uh, I don't I don't want to give it to the dispatcher, it's the end of my shift, I'm going home. And you wouldn't think it would be a big deal, but the guy who stole his bicycle comes back and they get in a fist fight and one of them dies. You are liable, and so is the dispatch center. Um, willful or malicious intent, you caller is just irate and they're cursing you out and they're calling you names and you get mad and you decide, I'm going to put in this call that this caller is uh, known to be armed. Just that the officers throw him to the ground and pat him down and stuff like that. Someone gets hurt, either the officer or the uh, or the caller, and uh, you're going to get sued. Um, dispatch centers can be sued for things a dispatcher does under certain cases as well. Sometimes it's just going to be you. If the dispatch center did everything it was supposed to, and you decide not to follow the rules, or you decide to deviate from your training or something along those lines, you do something purposely, uh, especially if it's willful or, want or malicious intent, um, it's probably going to be on you. But if the dispatch center had any way of knowing that that could have happened, then they can be sued as well, and that's called vicarious liability. The, th the three main things that dispatch centers have to watch out for are negligent hiring, meaning they hire somebody that they know they shouldn't have. They hire somebody with a, um, uh, a history of drugs, or they hire somebody who doesn't have the, let's say they have a, a requirement that you have to type 40 words per minute and you only type 35, and then you're too slow later and can't get a call in and somebody gets hurt. Then the dispatch center is liable. In that case, the dispatcher themselves wouldn't be sued. It would just be the dispatch center because they should have not hired you in the first place. Negligent retention. Uh, let's say you have a history of doing things like not entering calls for service, and they didn't discipline you, they didn't fire you, they didn't take any action to change your behavior. Uh, that's called negligent retention. So the one time you do it and somebody gets hurt, then the dispatch center is liable as well. And failure to train. You're doing the best you can. You are following your instincts on a call, but the dispatch center doesn't train you. And believe it or not, there are still dispatch centers without, without um, organized training programs, even here in Colorado. And they fail, you, fail to train you properly. You do something wrong on a call that gets someone hurt. They look into it and find out you were never trained on it, something that you, they should have been trained on, then the dispatch center is liable. So those are examples of vicarious liability. Um, Emergency medical dispatch, and we talked about this earlier, there is, and this question came up recently because someone thought, well, don't all dispatch centers have to do EMD? Most of them do, but there's no requirement. 
There is no federal requirement that dispatch centers do emergency medical dispatch. It's basically just good practice and it's what the citizens expect and that's why most dispatch centers do it. Um, states may require dispatch, emergency medical dispatch. Colorado does not, so we have some dispatch centers here in Colorado that don't. Most do just because, again, it's the right thing to do. States may or may not require the use of a specific EMD product. And there's, I list some of them down here at the bottom. There's several uh, big ones across the country, and there's some local ones. We have one, the, the, the last one down here, EMD of Colorado, is specific to our state. There are some dispatch centers using that. Um, but those states that require EMD may say you have to use a protocol approved by us, which might be just priority dispatch, or it might be priority dispatch and APCO meds, or something along those lines. Uh, they may have requirements that your dispatchers be trained on how to use it, which would be nice, or certified uh, to use it, which would also be nice. They may have a requirement that you have a medical director, which you're supposed to do anyway if, you, if you're using the EMD program. So all of these things are things that, that vary from state to state. Uh, what we're seeing is, as always, we see a trend towards more and more regulation on this. The states tend to be getting on board and saying, okay, all of our dispensers centers should be doing EMD, and if they're doing EMD, then they need to be doing it the right way, which means training all their people and so on. Um, hey, I just said all that. Okay, that was a duplicate slide. Sorry about that. Nuisance, false, or automatic alarms. And they actually broke this up kind of oddly on, the, uh, on your sheets. Nuisance and false alarms. I, I don't really like the... the term automatic alarms here, because I know what they mean. What they really mean is direct dial alarms. Most false alarms come from automatic alarms, too. They're just not going directly to 911. So when we say nuisance or false alarms, what we're really talking about are calls, are alarm calls that are going to a call monitoring center, like ADT or, or um, Broadview. I think they were bought out by ATT. Whatever those companies are, I don't remember the names of them now, other than ADT. And then they relay the call to a local call center a local 911 call center. And if you get, you send police officers out there to check out the situation, nothing's wrong. You send them out the second time, nothing's wrong. You send them out the third time, nothing's wrong. You're spending a lot of money on that alarm. So, a lot of local jurisdictions, this does not tend to be at the state level, this is usually cities that do this, pass ordinances saying that if you get a certain number of false alarms within a certain period of time, if you get like three false alarms within three months or something along the, those lines, then we will not respond to your call. Or we will respond to your call, but we're going to give you a ticket for $50. We're going to give you a ticket for $150 the next time or something along those lines. The idea is to, de to deter people from using faulty alarm systems that are causing false alarms to make some adjustments or improvements to the alarm system that they have so that we're not constantly sending police officers out to check uh, something where there's nothing wrong. Um, and like I said, those are usually found at the local level, not in state statute. When they say automatic alarms in the body of knowledge, what they're really talking about are direct dial alarms. These are alarm devices that automatically dial 911 when they're activated. Either it's either through a, a um, when they say automatic, so it's an automatic trigger, just like a house alarm for ADT, except instead of calling ADT, it calls 911. In a lot of states, those are illegal. A lot of states have passed statutes making those types of alarms illegal. Technically, they're not illegal in Colorado. Uh, a lot of local jurisdictions have passed ordinances making them illegal in Colorado, but at the state level, they're not illegal. Um, but they can be a, a real problem for, for PSAPs. Um, luckily, not a lot of them are sold because they're illegal in most states, so we don't get a lot of them in Colorado either, just sort of as a halo effect from other states making them illegal. Emergency notification systems, uh, in the body of knowledge, they call them mass notification systems. It's kind of an old name. The term that they tend to go by now are emergency notification systems. Um, you may also hear them referred to by a brand name. Reverse 911 is the biggest one uh, because they were one of the first ones out there, so a lot of people call it Reverse 911. Code Red, Everbridge. A lot of people will refer to them by the brand name of the product being used to deliver the service. But the service itself is called ENS, Emergency Notification System. Um, it's different than the emergency alert system. It's different than the wireless emergency alert system. Both of those 
are ways of getting emergency communication out to the public, but they don't use the public switch telephone network. So the key here with ENS, emergency notification systems, is that they use the public switch telephone network. You can send phone calls to people's houses to warn them of, of a specific piece of information. Um, there is no federal requirement that jurisdictions use ENS. It's completely up to the local jurisdictions. A lot of states have bought ENS systems to use statewide. Uh, so they will have one ENS system that's used the entire state. Colorado, it's allowed to be, we're allowed to spend 911 surcharge funds on ENS systems, which has really encouraged a lot of jurisdictions to do it, but it's technically not required either. You're not required to have an ENS system. And finally, uh, this was listed in your body of knowledge as well, bidding and purchasing laws. So I, I end my, my presentation on the most boring possible of the topics. Um, each state has different purchasing processes that government agencies have to undergo to purchase equipment and services that includes 911 call centers. Um, some states uh, may purchase the 911 telephone equipment for the PSEPs. An example of this is uh, Connecticut which has, it brought, they built a broadband ring statewide. They're delivering all their calls to their call centers in IP, and every call center in Connecticut uh, has a telephone system that was purchased by the state of Connecticut. The local government doesn't have to buy it. They don't have a choice in what kind they get, but they also don't have to pay for it, so it's kind of a trade-off there. Um, believe it or not, little tiny Connecticut has more call centers than Colorado does, so that's one of the reasons why they did it that way, because it was a heck of a lot cheaper than everybody buying their own. Um, local governments may be required to purchase from pre-approved state contracts. So this is kind of what they do in New Mexico when they want to buy, when a call center wants to buy a new phone system. First, they have to apply for a grant through the state. They say, we want some money out of our 911 surcharge funds. Here's why we need it. This is what we want to buy. But what they list as their option for, cho for, for buying has to be something that's already been pre-approved on a state contract. So the, the state negotiates with 911 telephone providers for the best price that, that they can get. And it's usually going to be cheaper than the call center could get if they were just going out and, con and um, negotiating the price themselves, because uh, they can get a, uh, a volume discount, essentially. Um, or local governments that are allowed to make their own purchasing decisions, like here in Colorado, uh, will issue RFPs. You'll hear that term a lot uh, if you ever get involved in any of the purchasing side of 911. An RFP stands for Request for Proposal. Basically, you're listing everything that you want the product to do. You're sending that list out to all of the people who you think might be able to provide that kind of equipment. They send you a proposal saying, this is what our product can do. And then there's a whole selection process that follows after that to make sure that what they told you the product can do, it can actually do that. Um, I've never heard of any local jurisdiction um, making purchases without that kind of process. So that's typically the process, is you will have an RFP that goes out. Uh, you know, if it's small purchases, if you're buying you know, a vending machine for your break room, you probably don't need an RFP. If you're buying a, a $1 million uh, 911 phone system, then you probably do need an RFP. So that's how, that, those are the different ways that um, each state uh, does their purchasing. They all fall somewhere within those three different possibilities. I have some additional resources here at the end. Um, they're listed on your handouts, but if you don't want to type in those long URLs, you can also go to the Resource Center website, uh, click on Resources, then EMP study groups, then session three, which is the number of this session. And how are we doing on time? Anywhere? 217. Okay, so I went a little over. I apologize for that. But does anybody have any questions for me? I threw a lot of information at you. If you have any questions that come up later, feel free to contact me. My email address is there on that last slide. Um, and I'll uh, be happy to. Um, answer you the best I can. And I'll, I'll try to remember, if I don't remember, send me an email to remind me and I'll look up that case with the, the jurisdiction that was sued over a HIPAA violation. Thank you, sir. Right, thank you.